systems. They know more than we give them credit for, and they have fresh ways of looking at things. So our teams, uh, we, we actually had two teams that were looking primarily at the concrete buildings. Um, in the upper right is a team that John Wallace left and uh, led, and then the lower left was a group of guys that I was working with. And no, that's not a concrete canoe there. Um, just happened to be a boat while we were surveying some concrete damage. Uh, we uh, focus primarily on the concrete building stock because that's primarily what the engineered uh, building stock is uh, in Chile. And so we spent time in, in the major cities, Santiago, uh, Valparaiso, and Viña del Mar, and some uh, coastal uh, communities there uh, that have condos, uh, stopped in Telca, Chian, uh, Talcahuano and Concepcion and, and didn't go any further south than that uh, and felt we did a fairly good job of seeing what the main uh, aspects were. Of course, along the way, there are many uh, beautiful things to see and, and it's wonderful that some of the, uh, much of the uh, historic uh, fabric of the region is preserved. I mean, here's Valparaiso, one of the beautiful places in the world, uh, UNESCO Heritage City. Uh, and it is a wonderful place to visit and still is today. Uh, Valparaiso came through fairly well uh, but many other historic structures here down in Talca, about halfway down toward the epicenter, uh, a church that didn't fare quite so well. And I don't know if you can see straight lines so well on the screen, but if you look, the uh, steeple is a little bit out of plumb. In fact, it's leaning about a foot over to the left on the top. Uh, the flying buttresses which come off this way are shattered, and this church almost certainly is, is a total loss in the city of Talca. Uh, city of Talca... Uh, in fact, was hit very, very hard. Uh, in my, my opinion, it was one of the hardest hit cities as far as shaking went. Uh, it was an old city. Uh, it had not been shaken really hard by recent earthquakes. And so there are many, many adobe uh, buildings, uh, small adobe buildings in this city. And, and many of them were, were, were wrecked. And I suspect what may happen to this city is what happened to Qi'an in the after the 1939 uh, Qi'an earthquake. Uh, I understand it was in a similar condition, and it was bulldozed, and the streets were widened, and it was rebuilt. Uh, Chian today, uh, which is about the same distance from the coast, uh, did fairly well compared with this city. So there's, there's a distinct difference in uh, construction eras and, and types of construction that were uh, used in different times. Uh, our group, though, was mainly focused on reinforced concrete building construction because, again, that's where we had understood uh, the main action was in engineered buildings uh, in Chile. And so starting out in Santiago, I was a member of a, a lead or advanced team that came in a few days before the others. And immediately in the paper, I noticed that there was information uh, in the newspapers about which buildings uh, were having trouble. And as John Bray mentioned, uh, if uh, you look, you'll notice that many of these buildings are clustered. And in some cases, the clustering may be associated with different construction and design groups. Uh, but uh, likely as not, it may be associated with soil uh, amplification effects. And that's something we need to uh, work out with our geotechnical friends as we go on. Before we look closely at these concrete buildings, I think it's worthwhile spending a few minutes thinking about and, and ex talking about what the uh, buildings are like in Chile and what's the underlying uh, practice and, and then how did all of them do. And then, of course, we've got to look at the small percentage that had problems. Uh, my uh, exposure in Chile occurred after the 1985 uh, earthquake near Viña del Mar and uh, studied many buildings after that earthquake and was uh, surprised to find that uh, almost all the buildings that were in construction, had been constructed there, were bearing wall buildings, reinforced concrete wall buildings, uh, an occasional column. It was a rarity to find a moment frame. And even today, it's, it's not common to find moment frames. Uh, it's very uncommon also to find any uh, high-rise construction of anything other than reinforced concrete. Uh, they exist, but they're pretty rare. Uh, looking at some of the data that was published in a, a publication by their uh, Concrete Institute in 2002, uh, this plots the wall area divided by the floor area in the ground floor. And uh, for many buildings from 19, roughly 50 until about 2002, and what we see is that the ratio of the floor area excuse me, the, the wall area, cross-section to the floor areas, uh, typically 2% or can be even higher in many cases. That compares in a U.S. construction where the ratio for buildings that have walls is more like a half percent or so. So these, wall, these buildings are full of sure walls. And uh, 
I was led to understand in 1985, and it was repeated to me many times, that when an owner, a condo owner, goes into a, uh, a condo to check out the quality, they knock on the walls, if they hear that, it's cheap, and they move on to the next place. They want to hear solid concrete in their buildings because that's what they've learned over the years works well. Now, it may look as if the wall quantities are staying constant. In, in a sense, they are, but the buildings are getting taller. And so, in fact, the, the amount of wall per volume of building is actually going down pretty substantially. And the wall thickness, uh, which when I was there in the 1980s was typically about 12 inches, it's more typically about 6 inches today. So things have really slimmed down. Uh, and it was something that we had known about and Chilean engineers had known about, and uh, many were waiting to see what was going to happen. Uh, one measure that's sometimes used... Uh, uh, in uh, assessing what the likelihood of damage is going to be is, is a ratio of the building height to period. And uh, because they have so many buildings that are of the same ilk, uh, one can easily compare uh, as a function of this quantity how much damage there is. And if one looks at the, the uh, World Housing Encyclopedia, uh, one actually finds that as the number goes down, which is in fact the trend that we've seen in recent years, uh, the damage goes up. And so it wouldn't be surprising to see more damage in this earthquake uh, just because of the changes in the buildings. The building code, uh, I won't go through all of it, uh, but just some uh, key points. Uh, the code, uh, I think, is still current. I'm pretty sure it is. is uh, was adopted in 1996. And read a few things. This is right out of the code. Uh, this standard aims to achieve structures that resist moderate seismic actions without damages, limit damage to non-structural elements during earthquakes of regular intensity, prevent collapse during earthquakes of exceptionally severe intensity, even though they show some damage. And those are things that I think we, we talk about in the United States as being, so it's fairly equivalent. There's a very interesting, almost commentary, but this appears in the body of the code. It says, in particular, the provisions for reinforced concrete wall buildings, in other words, all the buildings, are based on their satisfactory behavior during the earthquake of March 1985. And those buildings in 1985 performed exceedingly well. Uh, the, the, the boundary elements of those walls didn't have confinement reinforcement as we would use in similar buildings in the US. Uh, and that practice was carried over into their building code. Uh, there's a seismic coefficient uh, similar, not exactly the same as what we use. There's an R factor, which if one uses a static analysis method, the R factor is seven. It varies with period if one uses modal spectral analysis. So there are similarities, again, with our code, but there is a significant reduction from the elastic force levels. There are no specific provisions or prohibitions for vertical irregularities. And it says specifically when designing reinforced concrete walls, it is not necessary to meet the provisions of paragraphs, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the provisions that in the US code require confinement of the boundary zones. And of course, uh, in the official code, this is all in Spanish, but this is the official translation that was uh, given to us. How did these buildings perform? Uh, I obtained this information from Rene Lagos, uh, who had the data from, uh, I'm surprised I, I lost the, the original source of the data. I'll have to provide that in the uh, posted slides. Uh, but uh, considering just buildings built from 1985 to 2009, uh, there's uh, four roughly that collapsed, depending what you call collapse. Uh, I saw four, uh, but maybe one could find others and define a story here or there as a collapse. Uh, according to Rene Lagos, there's an estimate of 50 buildings that are significantly enough damage that they will have to be demolished. But that's his estimate. I've heard other estimates ranging from 50 to 150. Um, the number of buildings three stories and taller built in this 25-year time period is about 10,000. And of those, uh, only a half percent uh, fall in this uh, severely damaged category. If you go to the nine-plus uh, story buildings, it's closer to almost 3%. Now, uh, my understanding of uh, objectives for our current codes are that if we have MCE maximum considered shaking under a building, it's something on the order of 10% probability of collapse is considered acceptable. Now, 
that's not to say that all 9,974 of these buildings saw that much shaking. Uh, but uh, given that they had a strong earthquake, uh, very strong, I think the performance that's shown here by and large is really very good in terms of uh, collapse rates and, and high damage rates. Of course, one always then focuses on the buildings that had problems. And what I'm going to do next is to focus on what I think is really the, the key issue that exposed itself over and over again in, in many of these buildings. We saw lots of other things, and we'll be posting all those things with little narratives on the EERI website. But from here on, I'm going to focus on what I think was really the key problem. This is a building in Santiago. I think it's about 20 stories tall. Uh, it's not quite this slender all the way. Uh, we're looking along one face, the left-hand face, we're parallel to the wall, and then the building widens as it goes back uh, toward the back side. Uh, typical of many of these buildings, there is uh, underground parking. Uh, the lot is very narrow, so it's difficult for a car to get underground under these buildings, and so things happen under there. Uh, looking underneath, uh, this is a photograph of one of the walls, one of the main shear walls in the transverse direction. And uh, the wall is here. Uh, one can see that it's been uh, fairly well crushed. Uh, we'll talk in a moment about the details of the reinforcement that's there. But the wall's crushed. It has subsequently buckled. Uh, on the other side of the building, there are signs that all the walls are in very serious tension. And it's really the tension side of the building that's keeping this from going over. Uh, in the foreground, one can see black large black uh, steel tubes that have been put in to shore the building up. And eventually to lift this building back into position so it can be repaired. And we'll talk about uh, why and if later uh, at the end of the uh, presentations. A schematic of what I very commonly saw in, in these kinds of buildings is shown here. Uh, and this is just a very rough sketch to illustrate what the problem often was. There's typically a longitudinal axis in many of these buildings with one or two walls that form a corridor. There's several transverse walls. Uh, this is a really simple version of what it might look like, but parking very often went down underneath these buildings, turned right, and it was necessary to clip these walls. And the students referred to these as flag walls because they had the appearance of a, a narrow shaft and then a, a wider section up above. Of course, this region would be likely to be highly susceptible to uh, a failure, especially given that there's, in many of them, a very light transverse reinforcement. Uh, just one more example from Santiago, and we could go through many more, but let's just do one because the picture shows itself over and over again uh, in the basement of this building. And again, what we're, we're seeing here is across uh, the back is the longitudinal walls. Uh, in many cases, there's an impression that the building is, is sitting on these longitudinal walls and uh, leaning in one direction on the wall that's crushed that's in the transverse direction. And in, in many cases, the amount of uh, permanent deformation up at the roof is on the order of a foot. Uh, and clear signs on the other side of some of these buildings that they're in tension, uh, and the tension side is really holding them up, and they're balanced on the corridor wall. Uh, just looking at the details in one of these, uh, quite common to see. And in fact, I, I saw this in just about every wall that was exposed in this way. I didn't see any walls where they were crushed and there was what we would call confinement conforming to our code. Uh, what one typically saw was a, a hoop coming around, bending 90 degrees and bending 90 back. That was either repeated on the other side or else there was a single 90 degree bend. In some cases, the drawings showed 135 degree hooks, but the convention in construction, as I understand it, was to build it this way. And very often, it just got built this way because that's the way it had been done. And it had worked in 1985. Uh, there's recommendations. I don't believe it's part of the code, but at least a recommendation that there should be at least some transverse ties. I think it was six for every square meter of wall. I never saw one. Uh, but this is looking at the side face of one of these walls and how uh, the reinforcement uh, buckles, how the system comes apart. You know, backing up, if this is a six inch wall and the spacing is about six inches, this leaves essentially a wedge of concrete between the ties. That wedge is unstable 
And you can see the little wedges uh, coming apart and slipping through on the sides of this photograph. So I saw this in many, many buildings that I went into. Not all of the buildings have this, but this was one of the most common problems that I saw. Uh, one of the buildings that had made big headlines was from Concepcion, uh, further south. Uh, we're looking at a building that has toppled sideways uh, toward us, so we're looking at the roof. And uh, it was very difficult to gain access to this site, and I never actually physically witnessed exactly what was in this building, but I talked with people who uh, were there and had conversations and looked at what damaged pictures I had to get a picture of what I think happened. But again, it's conjecture, and we need to study this further. Uh, this is the building uh, before it was finished. You'll notice there's one tower here, and there's another here under construction. Uh, with time, I'm not going to try to go into any more detail. Uh, there is what I see a, a telltale uh, driveway leading underneath this building, uh, probably leading inside. Uh, in discussions with some engineers who... Uh, were knowledgeable of what had gone on in this building, uh, I have come up with this sketch of what I think has happened. But again, this is going to require additional study to know for sure. But this is more or less what the plan is purported to have been. Uh, long longitudinal corridor walls and transverse walls. Uh, there was another tower under construction. Uh, parking came in this way. If you took a section through uh, one part of the building, section A, it was something like that, uh, something like we'd seen before. And at section B uh, was even something apparently worse. Now, the, the specific details of this, I haven't been in to see. Again, this is uh, based on information from knowledgeable engineers uh, whom I trust. Uh, and you know, there is a commission that's been formed to study this building again or in more detail and really find out its, its problems. Uh, it's interesting if you look at the way this has come down is this is the center of the building where the corridor would be and it's essentially rotated about that central point and gone over. And so the, the, all the pictures are consistent with the other things that we've seen in similar kinds of buildings and with what I've, I've heard about this one. But this is going to require more study to really know it. Another really fascinating building uh, in Concepcion, uh, which I don't get yet, uh, and I don't, haven't had anybody yet fully explain it, and I was afraid to go in this one. I, I went in every building I saw except this one. Uh, and uh, now I wish I'd gone in because it's still standing. It was perfectly safe. <laughs> uh, if, we, let, let's, if we go around the left-hand corner and look at the back side, that's what it looks like. And notice this back face. It's clean. And the other back face is also pretty clean. And so the appearance is that uh, this has twisted around a core that's eccentric. That's what I understand of the building, but I don't know for a fact. But all evidence is that there's something to do with twisting here. If we look again at the front face, there's some interesting things to see. The first obvious thing is, of course, there's a little setback. Uh, so there's a core, we think, to the back. There's this very stiff frame or punched wall in the foreground here. There is a setback at this level, and there's been a failure there. Uh, not going to attribute it to anything. Uh, this part is dropped about a half story. This is dropped a full story. So there's a full story collapse in here. Uh, if we look a little higher, at that point is the top of this frame. There's another story that's collapsed right above that. So there's something going on there. I'm not going to try to analyze exactly what it is. And then there's the other frame around the other side, which is very similar to this one we see in front, but it's a little bit lower, cutting back the other way, and a story has collapsed there. So there's pretty clearly a coincidence between uh, this uh, setback and discontinuity, uh, the uh, transfers that are going on through diaphragms, twisting and so on, and the loss of stories. And so this is a, about the full elevation. It's dropped down about one story here, Two stories there, and then it works its way back up to full height there. <coughs> Fascinating building. Uh, another building where we saw both rocking as well as some failures uh, in walls. This very quickly, uh, evidence of rocking around this building. We called in Scott Ashford to take a break from the bridge team and come help us for a while. And he confirmed what we had observed. It was quite interesting that close to uh, Santiago, I didn't see 
many shear cracks in any buildings. I saw crushing. Uh, closer to the epicenter, we found buildings with shear cracks in the walls. And so there was clearly something different going on in the different locations. The closer we got to the epicenter, the more shear type damage we saw. There was fascinating things with transfers and diaphragms in this building and so forth that time doesn't permit to go into today. There will be fascinating opportunities to study Viña del Mar, which was studied in 1985. There were buildings damaged then that were damaged again. There were buildings that weren't damaged then that were damaged now. There were buildings that were retrofitted back then which either performed well or didn't perform well. And there's much to learn from this. Uh, and I think we need to spend a lot of time and, and effort studying these things. Uh, this is one, the Acapulco building, which I pictured previously was retrofitted and sustained pretty serious damage again this time. But others did quite well. Uh, back to the good news. You know, I've, I've pointed out several buildings that performed poorly. I could have given you 30 more. Uh, but uh, it's important to reflect back that many, many buildings performed exceedingly well. This is a 52-story high-rise building in downtown Santiago. No structural damage that uh, we could find. Uh, there was one uh, deck balcony that was uh, slightly damaged. It was an architectural uh, problem, we think. It had a tuned mass damper inside. Uh, but this high-rise building and many others performed exceedingly well, uh, considering the, the shaking that they saw. And that wasn't to be there. So uh, I think while uh, Bill Holmes is coming up, uh, this is my summary slide. Uh, we did see some buildings that showed lap splice problems but I had a, have a hard time attributing any of the poor performances to failures of lap splices of unconfined walls. They were damaged, but I don't think they were a real problem. Okay, Bill. Uh, 